All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Bill Ekstrom, who is up in Nebraska. How are you doing, Bill? Good job. How are you? Yeah, I was I say up in Nebraska because I'm down in San Diego, so pretty much everything is up from here. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and um, and Bill is the president and founder of Excel Institute, and he has spent his whole career in the sales arena. And he recently uh, recently published a book, The Coaching Effect, What Great Leaders to Do to Increase Sales, Enhance Performance, and Sustain Growth. And that's what we want to talk about today. So, so Bill, give me, a, give me kind of a background to the genesis of the book, and then we'll get into the content of it. Well, thank you for that opportunity, John. Mm -hmm. Seems like for a while now, many people have been asking us to put our work in writing in, in, in a book format, because so much of what we do is based on research and data. We, we love research and data, and we use it to, to guide and direct all of our programming, all of, all, all of our training, everything we do. So when we began this journey, it, it, it kind of started with the, um, well, it, with this discovery we had that so much of how salespeople perform, so much of their growth has to do with their boss, their manager, their leader, or what we refer to as their coach. Right. And we use that term because we believe they need to behave more like a coach than they, they do a manager or a leader. And, and so then we just decided to put all of our research together. And our work has been proven in the workplace. So we've seen if people behave and do these things a certain way, and if they track and measure it, kind of like the coronavirus, if, if you get a way to measure it, to figure out whether you got it, then uh, you can do something with it. And so why, why is it that people still today struggle with coaching? I mean, it still seems to be one of those areas that it doesn't come naturally to most people. And there's still a confusion about what is coaching versus managing versus telling people what to do. Yeah, well, that's how, how long do we have now, John? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it. it the genesis of it, we sit and we see in our research, it's pretty easy to understand. We talk about this in the coaching effect. When you think about why or how one gets to a leadership because they've done a good job at selling and, and organizations have this, and, and all of them, like Google, it doesn't apply to just sales, it applies anywhere in the world. If you do your job well, people think you need to then be a man and do with you. That, that's where it comes from. Is there's really uh, outside of, we believe and show that you have to have played the game to come over in the talents that make great coaches and the talents that make great, great salespeople. And, and then, then, so then what, so then what happens is then we put these people in positions, right? And we never train them to be coaches. We just say, okay, whatever you did, you figure out how to get other people to do the same thing. Yeah, exactly, John. And that's, and that's probably one of our major discoveries is that when we, when we looked at high performing sales teams and, 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 teams all across the country, across the world, quite frankly, what we discovered is there are a set of activities and behaviors that if coaches do with the right frequency and more, I don't know if you've been in sales management, but when I into it, I, I was lucky enough to have an amazing coach. I wrote about him in the book. But in my first role, I, I was given basically a credit card and it said, here's, here's a company card, here's your team, go get them, Tiger. Right. With, with no idea what, you know, what I should do. I just knew I had a number to hit. So there's that, nobody, yeah, there's no guidance or direction and, and nobody's tracking, even if there is guidance and direction, mm -hmm. nobody's tracking to know whether or not sales leaders are doing the right things to drive the most performance. We have all these resources we put against salespeople. We, we could tell you whether, we had an organization tell us one time, we know if they stop at Starbucks for a cup of coffee because we keep GPS is in their cars. Mm -hmm. They track everything imaginable. But when you ask them if they know what their leaders are doing to impact the performance of those people, they have no idea. 
No, absolutely. And it's an interesting point is, yes, so we're, we're so metrics driven in so many different ways, but there are no metrics for coaching and performance improvement. So at the beginning of your book, you talk about growth rings. Can you explain what they are? <laughs> sure. Uh, the growth rings came from a TED talk that mm -hmm. I did, a TEDx talk, excuse me, there's a difference there. The TEDx talk that I did at the University of Nevada, Reno. That went viral, and and the and it's funny because I'm just writing about it now in a, in a white paper because it applies so much to what's happening in the world and the pandemic today. But the growth rings are are a it, it's a model for understanding environments and how those environments impact our growth. And we I talk about those environments in the, in the sense of four things: a stagnation could be an environment uh, where things go backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, chaos could be an environment, which I think a lot of businesses are experiencing today. It's yeah. not a desirable mm -hmm. environment and it doesn't promote growth either, but it, it promotes people to want to fight, you know, fight the one of the three S, fight, uh, flight or free or yeah, flee. Um, exactly. Or freeze, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> freeze, fight or flight, stumbling over my words. And, and so there's a lot of chaos. That's another environment. Um, order is where we, which is really what people want, predictable inputs and predictable outcomes. And that's what creates comfort. The challenge is the fourth environment is the only environment where growth occurs, and that's called complexity. Mm. And complexity, not in the sense of things that are, are complicated, but in the sense of naming an environment. And that's where Inputs are changed and outcomes are now different. And it, that's what creates discomfort. So that's where that phrase that I've been tagged with for now a couple of years, that growth only occurs in a state of discomfort coming from. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, and it's true. And if you look at it in any any aspect of life or sports or whatever it is, yeah, yeah growth comes through. You have to put yourself in 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 areas of discomfort in order to get to that level, get to that next level. Uh, but that's a big challenge for a lot of people because obviously the status quo is very tempting. Um, stagnation, if it's not hurting you or if it's not overtly hurting you, is tempting. But as we say, today, everybody's being thrown into a state of flux. So how would you advise companies today to say, okay, this is a terrible thing that's going on, but there are some upsides to it. If you look for them in terms of we are in a state of, of, of chaos or flux, now is probably the best time for us to, to instigate some change. John, that's a really good point. And one of the things that, while I don't like the position we're in now because mm -hmm. it is more chaos than complexity. Sure. But I assure you there will be growth that eventually comes from this. Everything will evolve, everything will change now. So what we've been recommending, two, two things. Number one, and you don't, uh, and this is, a, it's a promotion, but yet it's not because we're doing this for free. Sure. One of the things we've developed because we're a research-based company is a COVID survey. So what it is, it's a 12 question survey that organizations can run on their employees to really understand where their minds are right. How worried are they? Are they really in a state of panic? How are your leaders helping them right now? Are they doing the things they should be doing to keep them in a state of right now? We believe order is a good place to be because when we come out of this, we have to be healthy enough to move forward. Yeah. So what we've been telling people and in, in what our research shows, John, is that leaders right now, coaches in sales or anywhere in business, need to really focus on that relationship piece with their people. They need to let them know that they matter. They need to let them know they care about them. And it's not business as usual right now. It's just not. And if they're able to do that, that's what brings order more than anything is if you don't have to guess whether or not my boss cares about me. that. Yeah. If you can show that and prove that, they will be there with you. They'll stick and throw with you. And they'll come out of this uh, in a healthy way. And that's what's most important for businesses to take care of right now. 
And I think you can do that as well. And I think there's there is a certain confidence and comfort if you do that outreach, but then you sort of, I mean, you acknowledge the situation as it is today, and then you focus in on, okay, let's see what we can do right now and focus in on the things that you can actually achieve. Because I think people feel better when they're feeling like they're doing something as opposed to just kind of sitting there waiting for this to be over. So I think the, oh, if, the, no if, the out, if the outreach is also is I care about you, but hey, let's 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 do some work. All right, just be showing you care about me has nothing to do with my getting not getting work done. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, we see the opposite. I think to your point, the sad part is is in our existing research that we're doing, literally as we speak with organizations across the world on this, six almost six out of ten. Leaders of teams are not expressing to their people that they care about them at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's that when that happens, John, I don't want to do work. If yeah, I do, no, you good point. if you tell me you care, if you're say, listen, we can do this. We're in this together. We'll be OK. Let's get after it. I am there with you. Mm -hmm. But if I don't think you care, if I don't see you there with me. If you're not expressing that, I am going to probably sit around in a state of chaos in a frozen position. And if you think about it, I mean, that's obviously a model thing, right? So it has to come from the very top, right? Because if the CEO is making sure that the executive team feels, you know, feels like he cares or she cares and they're there for them and so on and so forth, if it's not happening and employees aren't feeling it, it's probably because it hasn't come down the levels. Yeah, I th that's that's a good point, John. And, and we see that as well in our research that it, it does begin up there. But now is a time for leaders to, the opportunity is amazing for them to step up. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to, to really be a difference maker in the lives of their team, in the lives of their customers is there. And we're gonna see where this comes out. This is, we look at this as our team at Excel Institute. This is what we've been waiting for in a weird way. Not that we want pain, not that we want this this, this, this much right. chaos in the lives of people, but this is what we help people really train to do. It's so much of your leadership and coaching effectiveness is perceived in down times. And this is clearly mm -hmm. one of those times. And this is going to be a period that obviously it's a profound period that everybody is going to remember and they're going to remember what happened as they went through it. They'll remember what it was like at home in their communities. They're going to remember what it was like at work. And as you say, this, while this is not something that anybody would, would welcome, this is a fantastic opportunity to build a stronger bonds of, of teamwork and, and collaboration and, and all, everybody kind of coming together to achieve. So, and that is something that people will be able to remember and draw on in years to come. It, it absolutely will, John. Again, with the right attitude. And in, 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 I, I use this in the TED Talk. I shared this example is that I got fired from a job mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 2000s. And while as painful as it was at the time, and, and that event probably put me in a state of chaos at the time, eventually leading to complexity and growth. But people would say, okay, if you were upset, if that hurt so badly, if it threw you for such a loop, where's the growth? Well, quite frankly, John, you and I probably wouldn't be on this call. Mm -hmm. if I had not been fired back in 2008 right. or whatever it was. You know, I would, the Excel Institute would not be alive today had I not been fired back then. So there will be good outcomes that come from this, only for those who have the right attitude, who search for them and who capitalize on them. And when I use that term capitalize, I don't mean in a wicked way or a vicious way. I mean, in a, in a positive, healthy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the other thing is that everything is not going to go back to exactly the way it was before. I think you're, people are kidding themselves if they think that it will some of it will and some of it will evolve, but some of it needed to change anyway. And I think that's the, I think if you look on it as, as an opportunity to improve, here's a really good one is companies were paying a lot of lip, lip service to digital processes, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get around to them. But when business is good, it's like, eh, we, we can put up with inefficiencies. You know, now you realize what the result of putting up with inefficiencies is because when something like this hits, 
you're you're in a world of hurt. So there's lots of great opportunities. The same with with virtual and remote working. Maybe companies, a lot of companies, are going to discover that it's actually a better a better thing for their employees. Their employees enjoy it more. It's more productive. So there's lots of things to come out of it as long as you don't just look for the world to be reset, like to just reset the clock, the game clock back to where it was just before. The right. Days. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. So how do you think that people should, uh, as they come into it now, you know, especially with, with leaders and, and coaches, how should people, how should they coach their people to start looking for ways to improve and change things as we emerge? What we see that the best leaders have done, and I believe most effective coaches will continue to do, is ask questions. Mm -hmm. And as simplistic as that sounds sometimes, John, there's so much power in that. It's collaboration. It is the capital. It is capitalizing on the intellectual. Um, it's a redundant, but on the intellectual capacities of all the people on your team. So the best leaders are really going to sit back and watch right now, ask questions. Then when we come out of this, they'll be more prepared because there's power in that. If they, if they really do a good job capturing the collective wisdom, they will come out on top. Because the, the one person that sits in front of the ship and says, I see it, I'm on it, I got it, everybody leave me alone, I'll, I'll lead us forward, <laughs> they're going to lose. Yeah. They, just, they just won't go as far as if they capture everything. And I, th and I think that's a really good point to, to end on here and really underline that because you're right. Uh, if you are asking questions of people, if you're challenging their thinking, uh, it's making them feel part of this. Uh, there's nothing worse than if you, as you say, if you're just sitting in the boat and going, well, I hope he knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And not to mention the psychological safety it yeah. creates as a byproduct as well. So there's all positives. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Bill, this has been fascinating. Uh, the book is called, let me get the title back again here, The Coaching Effect, What Great Leaders Do to Increase Sales, Enhance Performance, and Sustain Growth. And as you know far better than I, Bill, uh, coaching is a much neglected area, but it is one of your greatest multipliers if you, if you pay attention to it, if you can get people coaching properly uh, and they can get more out of the out of the people who they're working with, that's a huge multiplier in any organization. So I think hopefully coming out of this, uh, there'll be a renewed focus or maybe a focus for the first time on, on coaching in a, in a more serious way. Yeah, I, we believe that as well too, John. And we know that the most valuable asset you can give any, whether frontline, whether it's a salesperson or frontline engineer or anything else, the most valuable resource you could give them is a great coach. That's a manager's role, first and foremost. Yeah, and obviously learn how to coach because it's not exactly. <laughs> coaching isn't the same as that guy who coached your sports team in school, right? And and that unfortunately is most people's uh, uh, premier experience with coaching. They, that guy was at the sideline shouting at them, "Do this, do that, stop doing that, do right. this." Say so that's not coaching. Learn how to coach properly. Right, exactly. And then measure it to make sure you're doing it. Absolutely. Well, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, Bill Ekstrom. This has been fantastic talking to you. All of Bill's information will be in his contributor profile, so you'll be able to find out more about Bill. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your institute. Well, thank you for that opportunity, John. The Excel Institute is uh, ecselinstitute.com. And we started in sales departments, and now we work well beyond that. But primarily what we do is we help organizations measure, train, implement, and then track and analyze coaching effectiveness in the workplace. Because if you do that, nothing has greater, nothing elevates performance more than having a great coach. So that's what yeah. we do. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I genuinely say that, and I genuinely believe that is coaching is so critical. It's something that you should all pay attention to. And if you've been neglecting it in the past, now's the time. It's no better time like now. Well, listen, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure.